I would love if higher education did not cost. Um, it would be great for us to move to that in, in this country, but also as an Urban League leader, um, and I know it was mentioned, I was past CEO of the Urban League. I'm still the CEO until later this year. But what we do at Urban Leagues is we are educators. So we teach folks about the housing issues and how they impact the Black community, but we also teach folks how to become a first time home buyer. We teach, you know, yesterday we had our, uh, our first COVID vaccine clinic and we're providing education around, um, you know, why to get the vaccine, why to consider it, answering questions for folks who are hesitant. Um, so when I say education, it includes housing, um, healthcare education broadly, as well as employment and justice. I mean, I find my role in life and using those experiences that I spoke about with Shauna as an opportunity to share my story, to educate people, um, to see things the way that I experience them, but also to work in communities so that I can hear other folks' stories and experiences so I can understand their perspective and, and where they're coming from. And I think that's the work, just better understanding each other and the issues that persist and try to work really hard together to find solutions. That will be the work that I do until the day that I leave this earth. Education being number one. <laughs> Uh, excellent. And uh, education is the great differentiator, that's for sure. Um, there will be people who will say to you, we can't throw more money at the problem and expect it to be fixed. What, um, and I, and, you know, I have to agree with them. It's so it's got to be, you know, really targeted. What, uh, what specifically do you think we can do with more money to make things better? Yeah, some of the things that we actually worked on to achieve this past session. So when I think of higher education, um, since this is a UW program, we want to make sure that we're investing money in, you know, training and opportunities around diversity, equity, and inclusion for staff. We want more money for schools of business. We want more money um, to make sure that there is access to college. But I think in infrastructure, in education, in training. Um, making sure that we're providing access. There are so many things that we can do with funds, but you know, it, it does have to be solution oriented. And I think those of us who are affiliated with higher education can point to a number of ways to make really good investments so that we're not just throwing the money, but we are investing in our future and in our students and in our staff and faculty, um, paying you know students, paying staff, increasing wages so folks feel a sense of belonging. I mean, there, there are, um, or value, I shouldn't say belonging, but a sense of, of value and they're being paid well, but there, there are a number of ways just in higher education where we can make those investments for our future. Senator, I got to ask you a question that's a little bit sensitive, but I know there are people who want me to ask this question. And it is that so much of, so many of us can't watch the news anymore because we're just tired of uh, the two political parties arguing with each other. Yeah. How do you fix that? Well, good job not watching the news. I don't even have TVs in my house, so I can't watch the news. <laughs> um, but I, I think having one session under my belt and having these moments when I, when I said to myself, this is the longest I've ever spoke to someone I knew was a Republican. I realized how much I stay in my own bubble. Some of that is healthy. I need to stay away. And I'm not, this is not a, a party statement, but I do want to practice good self-care and not be around folks who are toxic, who are being hateful. And if, so, if that is their behavior or rhetoric, um, I do want to stay away from them. But I will never get to know people who are, who I perceive to be different than I am if I don't spend more time with them. And so spending more time as we talk about political parties with folks who have different political views where, you know, kind of like we talked about race, so much of it is what you've learned and so much of it is not true. And in order for us to move forward in a healthier way, we should spend time getting to know folks that we have the capacity to get to know their ideas, their beliefs. And we do need to continue to stay away from folks who are not gonna be healthy for us and their behaviors. Um, as I would say, their, their behaviors kill people who look like me. Their behaviors are dangerous and deadly. So I won't spend time with them. But there are too many people who I just don't understand. And I want to know 
their stories, especially as a state senator and as a leader at the Urban League. Um, it's not good enough to be comfortable. I want to move myself out of my own comfort zone and I ask others to do so with the goal of finding ways to be solution oriented, to find unity, to stay hopeful. Um, but it isn't just about me and mine. I want it to be about community. And I think what we can sometimes hear on media, and that's including you know, social media, Facebook, Twitter, can, can be messages that are not true. Um, and you, you could read something out there about me that could be not true. But getting closer to connecting with human beings to learn the facts, to ask someone a question like, did you say this? Is this true? Do you feel this way? What, what, what do you think about this? Um, and move past assumptions will be very beneficial for all of us. But we, we can't rely on, on single sources that I think exist to um, make us upset, to provoke emotions that aren't always healthy or productive. So we get to use our time more productively in the ways that we connect with each other as community. Yeah, let's just go out and play basketball and, that, and that'll take care of things. Listen, can you play? Can yeah. you hoop? Then let's yep. do <laughs> I can hoop, I can hoop, but not as, not as good as I could when I was younger, that's for sure. Same here. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to remind everyone that Senator Nobles has been uh, uh, very uh, generous with her time. We only have a few minutes left, so if you've got some questions, now is the time particularly uh, students, our, our students. We'd love for questions to come from our students. Um, the Pacific Northwest itself is a leader in so many different things. Um, can it be a leader in taking care of some of these problems that we've talked about here? Because they're difficult. And you as a, as a state senator are kind of right in the middle of all of it. I, I think so here in the Pacific Northwest. And not in, not in the Pacific Northwest passive aggressive way, but because I've lived in places where there is intentional segregation and isolation. And I was excited about moving to the Pacific Northwest because this is a place that I feel works tremendously hard to embrace diversity. People have migrated across seas and states to be here in this place. Um, and so I think of, of all areas, the Pacific Northwest can be a leader for change, can be a leader for justice, can be a leader in doing what's right. Even as we talk about the COVID pandemic, we have an opportunity to be a leader and show folks how to keep our community members safe and alive and, and do the right thing um, for an entire state. So I'm faithful and hopeful in what we can achieve here in the Pacific Northwest. You know, Senator, I'm going to do what I do in class. I'm going to call on somebody, and I'm going to, and I, I hope that he's uh, close to his microphone. Javon, are you with us? Because Javon has had uh, some military experience as well, and is a really excellent student. Let's see. I'm from South Carolina originally. Um, I've been out here since 2015. I work on. Uh, I don't know if you guys see these big C-17 aircraft uh, flying yeah. around, and um, I, I work on that. And uh, my experience out here has been. Uh, pretty uh pretty good i like the area you know this time of year is pretty nice and um the air force place you in this certain community and then um now you're part of the community and then uh one thing they try to tell us is uh get out in the community and try to help try to do this and that um to bring well, the, i think uh, you would you would agree with me that uh senator nobles has definitely gotten out into the community <laughs> yeah yes yes um i guess one question i would have um you know, our base is in your uh, area. Uh, what do you think we as military people can do more to uh, um, incorporate ourselves into the community? And that's a good question. First, thank you for your service. And I think our military community already does a lot by sacrificing their time, their families to serve. I was a, we moved here because we were stationed at Fort Lewis and I was a military spouse for 16 years and both of my parents were in the army. Um, so I have a great appreciation for our military community. I also know the challenges associated with moving to different cities, serving your job and doing it well, so, you know, showing up as a service member, doing your job, going home, maybe having a little bit of a social life. But I found that for my own family members who exited the military, their experiences were kind of limited to 
what they sacrificed for so long, which is a very beautiful thing, all that they gave, but then understanding their community, even when I think about my ex-spouse who worked so hard for his family and served in the military, but did not have the same connection to community that I did. As a spouse, I worked on campaigns and you know got connected to the Urban League and my um, ex-husband did what he was supposed to do. He showed up and worked hard for his family. I want there to be more that we do for our service members to connect them to community, to make sure that we are providing an open invitation to volunteer, to coach, and it's tough. I mean, I know based on experiences, we we went through three deployments. It's like there, my ex-husband was infantry. It's like, if he wasn't training, what extra time did he have? Um, so trying to find, I think more creative ways for us as a community to engage our service members. Um, but I also think if any service member is interested in volunteering, you can always come to the Urban League to get involved. If you were talking about sports today, I think if folks are interested in sports, the good thing about sports is they're seasonal, but to jump in and just coach, I, I, um, crave my connection to community like I couldn't just like work at the urban league and go home and do family I need to be out whether it is offering summer camps or being with friends like I as much of an introvert as I am I need to do something that is connecting me to community but I think anything from serving as a at a food bank or talking to classes about your experience as a guest speaker whatever someone wants to do I mean you could uh, and I'm not saying you as in you, but I'm just saying any individual. I, I love the service members who've come here and started companies and, you know, stayed here after they exited the service because they retired here or they moved and came back and made here home. But I think, you know, there are so many opportunities for us to think about what we can do to provide access for our military community to feel like this isn't just a place where they work and they serve for maybe three years, but this is a community that they're ingrained in um, but i'm certainly not asking you to do more but if you know folks who are looking to get involved definitely connect them to the urban league and we can help them to do that um i have three kids who still live at home that i'm sure if somebody wants to babysit that's good service okay they can start there <laughs> but i'm willing to help in any way that i can but i'd love to know what more we can do for our service members Senator, we've taken up a, a way too much of your time. Do you have time for one more question from Professor Jane? I do. Okay. Thank you for your time. Uh, I have learned so much listening to you and I so appreciate the opportunity. So you mentioned that the Senate, you know, the, as an institution is kind of built on excluding people that look like you and other uh, people of color. Uh, so I, I would say institutions of higher education are no different. They have also got uh, racism institutionalized quite an extent. So I would like to uh, uh, request you to reflect on your experience when you were a student as an undergrad or a grad student in the classroom. And, uh, you know, of course, this is a much bigger discussion, but talk to us about what would be the one or two things that a professor could have done differently for you to have felt more included or received a, a superior value from your education? Yeah, I had really good professors. So I'll tell you the things that they did that made me feel included. I don't have a lot of things that they didn't do, but you know, I mentioned I was when I was in college, most of my college career, if not my entire, I think my entire college career, I was a military spouse. When I, um, so a lot of those years, I also was single parenting because we were going through deployments. And I remember when my now 16 year old son was born, he was born with Hirschsprungs and my husband was deployed. And I just couldn't focus on school. And my professor was so gracious. And, you know, I'm a pretty good student. Um, and it was, I think the class was like, politics and mass media, but my professor was very gracious and did not take this approach of, you're not here, you're not focused, you're not attentive. My, my newborn baby is in the hospital. And I appreciated that my professor did reach out to see what's going on because the expectation is you're an adult, you reach out to your professor, you tell them that you're going through something. 
but sometimes as students, it is really hard and we can't prioritize that communication based on what's going on in life. And I don't know that I did a good job of doing that. And the, a different type of professor could have said, you didn't follow the rules, which is if something's up, you need to tell me, and then we can make adjustments. And I could have failed that class. I think I ended up getting a C, but my professor worked with me as a you know young mom who was managing kids and a sick baby and a deployed spouse. And so I passed that class successfully. I also think about, um, oh my God, there were just some things that in college, I just did not know. And my vocabulary has always been an incredible challenge. I just speak in like layman's terms. And that's the way I like to be. I'm not trying to be critical of myself. But I remember there was a high expectation of where my writing should be. And it just wasn't there. My, patients, my, my professors were very patient in helping to bring out of me. And, and I'm mostly thinking of my um, classes once I was taking mostly because my undergrad is in US politics. And I really, I mean, I have run for office numerous times now. So I was really interested in the subject. But if they only would have judged me based on this is what it should sound like and this is what it should look like instead of learning more about what is it that you're trying to articulate and tell me. And I don't know if that's because I went to a, a small school. I don't know if it's because my professor simply cared, but I it kept me engaged because I didn't just score badly on the essay because it just wasn't written. I didn't even, when I was in college, I did not know what the word redundant meant. And I'm not kidding to you. Someone, I got peer feedback on one of my papers and it was like, well, this section is redundant. And I was like, what the hell does this even mean? Like, what is this word? <laughs> Um, and so I just laugh at myself, but I had professors who really, they believed in me and kept encouraging me and they did, they did not give up on me because I didn't fit a certain mold or a certain level of readiness. And I think it was also just coming from the South and some of my experiences, the way that I, you know, um, communicated at that time was very different. And I'm like, I don't speak this way, so I don't write this way, but they were so patient and just ensured that I had a positive experience no matter what I was going through. <laughs> and, you know, that worked for me. That, that made me not drop the class. You know, any of these classes I kept pushing through. Um, and now I'm, I hate to call myself a politician, but, you know, now I'm serving in politics. And my undergrad experience, it, it really inspired and kept me going. You know, it, that's the subject that I was interested in. And I'm so glad I had amazing professors who just seemed to always have my back. So just, you know, keep believing in students and just, I mean, I've been a teacher. So there are some students where I'm like, look, you're putting no effort into it. But there are some students where it just is different. It's a different look. It's not, it's not traditional, but that's what I, I, I have sent so many students to UWT because that should be a place where non-traditional is what's encouraged. Um, and if our liberal, you know, our predominantly white institutions are going to actively recruit students from different backgrounds and say we want to diversify, then we can't focus on just the institution the way it's always been. We have to be open to this looks different, but I wouldn't be who I am if they had given up on me and if I couldn't obtain my degree or if they made it more challenging for me. Because I had so much on my plate and I just wanted to, you know, break the generational curse and graduate from college. And they helped me to do that. Senator, thank you so much for your time and answering our questions in such a great way. Uh, oh my gosh. I, I guess the, the best way to close it is we'll see you at Cheney Stadium. <laughs> see you there. Thank you. Thanks for your time and your questions. I really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye everyone. Thank you. You're welcome.